Hey everyone, welcome to this third and final episode in our series of looking at Azure Lighthouse from different perspectives. Today's perspective is the one from the Microsoft reseller, or as they may be known in the industry now, Microsoft Service Partners. So if you're tired of engineering your own solutions to help your customers, or if you need to guide your customers in their cloud spend, this is an episode you don't want to miss. We're going to be joined by Patrick O'Leary from SoftChoice, and we'll get right into it right now. Hi, Patrick. How are you? Good, good. I'm uh, happy to be here. How are you doing? Well, I'm good. I'm really uh, happy to have you in our uh, series on uh, Lighthouse from different perspectives. And uh, your perspective is from the reseller portion, right? Yeah, yeah. We are uh, certainly a very large reseller from an Azure perspective. And um, also, we are an Azure expert MSP and do uh, services as well. Okay. Uh, and how long have you been using uh, Lighthouse? It's been over about a year and a half that we've been using the technology in uh, our operational model with how we work with our customers. Okay, and what were you using before? Is uh, so what <laughs> did you move from, and 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 that'll start the conversation. Sure. So we had built a bit of custom technology that we integrated. Uh, we utilized the components of Azure Active Directory and did a shared services kind of model where we would implement um, a centralized Azure AD topology and extend that and federate it within to our customers' Azure subscriptions. Okay. Uh, it was sort of like Lighthouse where in very many ways. It accomplished the same things, but it was it was engineered by some great talent that we have here at SoftChoice. So when when uh, we had the opportunity to switch to Lighthouse, it was like, oh, well, we've been doing this for a couple of years. It's awesome that there's sort of a package solution now that we don't have to have our own custom developed solution. Yeah, you don't have to, ma to manage the code on top of managing your customer's code? Yeah, yeah, that was, that was certainly a, a, a challenge that introduced extra layers of troubleshooting. And, you know, when you would have any type of issues you had to track down, there was that added layer of our own you know, interaction at the security layer that that we had to consider, and uh, having broad knowledge of that across the teams, you know, proved a, a challenge, but um, it was solvable and it worked well. But then, the Lighthouse uh, technology really introduced some new capabilities that we wanted to take advantage of. So the cost and time that we had to develop to switch really made sense to us. Okay, so so I'm a little shy in my knowledge of all of the different types of partners that we have and and exactly where they fit in the ecosystem. So you are a reseller. So my initial thought was, okay, well, somebody wants to buy software, they buy software from you and deploy it. How does that lighthouse and managing your customer's environment, like how does that fall into the reseller model? Sure. So as a reseller, Microsoft has obviously moved away from boxed copies of Azure. It doesn't really exist, right? So exactly. a, a customer has to subscribe to that technology and subscribe to, you know, the use of that through through what we tend to use the word to describe as consumption or consuming of that cloud environment. Yep. So as a partner that works in a reselling motion, the reality is we're not really reselling anything anymore. We're more of a services partner first than we are right. a reseller in the relationship we have with the customer. So uh, that really drives the technology changes at, at sort of the use case level. So at a, at a simple way to look at it is in the prior to subscription-based licensing days, we would every, you know, on a yearly cycle, help the customer true up and understand their licensing spend and all that kind of stuff. And there was an EA three-year cycle and, and those kind of things. Now that value has to be delivered on a month to month basis because that true up cycle is technically down to minutes and seconds in some cases of the Azure services. So it, it's less about a, a routine interaction that we have with the customer over the course of years. It's more of like a day to day operational support and enablement partnership that we have to build with the customer. So when we look at how we delivered that prior service versus how we deliver the, the, the new model of, of helping customers use Azure in every way that they can, it's it's a lot more hands-on. It's a lot more tied into what the customer is actually trying to achieve. So Lighthouse really is the technology now that enables us to have that close relationship within the customer 
um, so that they're buying and consuming it and we're helping them do that. Okay. Uh, because I, I used to be in services uh, with Microsoft and, and Premier Service, and that was my, it was always an, a go-to answer when customers came in with, okay, I've got licenses for this and I've got this program and am I covered for this? And I would always tell them, go see your LAR or your large account reseller. Um, but now you're doing that on a, like almost day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, yeah, like constantly, basically. Like the the, the challenge with uh, something like Azure is there's literally thousands of SKUs. Um, so it's less about, hey, here's a bill that you get and here's all your SKUs. It's really about how do they actively and dynamically deploy those things. So um, that, that actually led us to becoming an Azure expert MSP partner, which okay. enables us to really prove ourselves through an audited process. But the idea is that we want to be that go-to contact point for the customer to use and learn about how to use further their Azure footprint and the technologies available to them. So it's inclusive of helping them govern, helping them report on, helping them secure, deploy, optimize, all these kind of concepts of how they can use cloud or stuff that we want to deliver to them as part of really replacing the legacy reseller model with more of a services first approach. And then in effect, we're doing reselling, but it's sort of as a result of us driving the services up front. And Lighthouse, that is one of the core enabling technologies for us to do that. Okay, I was, that, that was a perfect segue because I was just about to ask, how does Lighthouse fit in that model? And how does it help you help your customers? Yeah, yeah, so the, the way it fits is that, as you can imagine, when, when you're managing that relationship with hundreds to thousands of companies at one time. We have a, a fairly large footprint of customers that we work with every day in Azure. And the challenge is if you had individualized security connectivity for every single customer where you had to operationalize pretty much hundreds of our people to interact with all these thousand plus customers, the issue is managing all that in a safe and secure way. It's very easy for some of that to get lost in the noise or um, somebody writes it down on the classic sticky note on their desk. Those are keys to the customer castle that we do not want anybody to get. Yeah. So what our initial use of Lighthouse really was for was to reduce that risk profile and really raise our security and how we interact with the customer environment. And so we utilized it to implement a just-in-time and just-enough access methodology so that when our people who do go hands-on into the customer's environment they were requesting a, a time boxed access to that environment. And then also they have a, uh, an approval chain to get that access. So they're only allowed to work with whichever customers they're authorized to work with during that time window. And finally, it creates an audit trail. So for us, uh, the, the use of Lighthouse enabled us to timestamp the activities that that employee was doing in the customer environment. And that allows us then to have a audit trail of actions taken. So if, if a customer uh, feels that we might have been involved in an issue that popped up, we have the full audit trail showing what that engineer did at that time. And we can, you know, either defend or or confirm the customer's, you know, in, insinuation that we were involved in it. So initially it was it was highly useful in reducing our liability situation there, as well as, you know, really enhancing our confidence and having hundreds of people interact with thousands of customers and um, and not have that sort of worry in the back of your head that something's gonna something's gonna go wrong from a security prospect yeah it, it's really as much as a comfort blanket for the customer as it is for you because you start with a very set and and auditable and and configurable set of permissions so the customer doesn't have to worry that maybe you're doing something you shouldn't be doing when you're accessing those systems Exactly. And because because it's all logged and reportable, we can generate reports showing that activity to the customer if they if they find that useful. It also helps them with their industry audits and, and other kind of compliance audits as well. So a lot of times because many of our customers are in an industry where they've got to prove that partners that work with them are just as secured as they are, we have this technology to show their auditors and their, you know, and, and help them achieve that without worry from our perspective. So as a reseller or a uh, managed or a service provider, a uh, service partner, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, does the governance of the, your customer's environment come into play? Like, do you help them 
manage that part of of the uh, the Azure uh, footprint? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we evolved over the past, let's say, decade from that reseller relationship to the MSP and and you know more advanced services partner with these customers naturally, and and um, you know the enabling technologies and reasons to do that are, are numerous. But what I think really made the most sense for us is that when we start to look at how customers spend money in Azure, cost controls and governance mixed with operations, operational business rules that they want to enforce on that environment, those are the two areas where our expertise in the resale motion in our, you know, our legacy of, of doing uh, great work with Microsoft technology at, in that reseller process translated very well into a managed services model that it that looks like on the surface a reselling motion but under it is really the, the more modern way to help a customer buy and consume azure and that is through the governance that is really helping them implement policies and controls yep. and the way we do that is uh has evolved a lot we used to do it very manually on a per customer basis and with with the lighthouse technology we can actually uh piggyback across that connection to implement uh, automation and deployment technologies across the lighthouse uh, connection point that we have. And that enables us to really be confident in a standard set of governance policies and procedures across all customers. And then we can customize per customer after that. So we, we do a lot of like really granular um, alignment of each customer's like purchase mechanisms and business approval rules and processes. Yep. Sort of, I, you know, a, a, a more common word these days is FinOps, but I, I would say it's it's more just general governance <laughs> of how they use and spend money. Uh, governance and financial operation is a very important uh, portion of the business, especially when, you, when you're working in an environment that is uh, pay for play, like a consume model, where it's not like you're deploying that server in your data center and you have so many cores and so much RAM and it's there whether or not you use it, but you've already paid for it. So it doesn't matter in, in Azure, uh, if you're using it, you're paying more for it. Yeah, so when we look at how these companies are spending money as they transition into more and more of their workloads going to a cloud consumption based operating model, the way that they think about money is very different. Um, I used to be an internal IT. I also have worked in a uh, data center hosted company in my my past roles before joining SoftChoice. And um, that was very much a CapEx business model, multiple year hardware refresh cycles, renewal yep. licensing, things like that. When we, when we help customers migrate from that into a cloud consumption model, the ways in which they think about spending money versus the value they get for that money shifts from a uh, depreciation schedule of a three or four year cycle or whatever they they yep. have on their hardware down to what's the benefit what's the use what's the performance i get maybe down to the second or minute of that service and they're thinking about things like throughput uh, scalability burstability business resiliency um, in a much different context than if you're just going to have multiple data centers with replicated data and servers so that's one of the biggest areas that we see a lot of customers sort of change their viewpoint and we have to help them with that because the old ways of thinking about spending money on technology really shift as well. And mm -hmm. um, many customers can get there and, and get there fast and others need help. And so that's where we help in that in that purchasing relationship. So we actually do two things to help them. One is we uh, fully report and give them full visibility and dashboards into how they spend money on Azure yep. um, down to the SKU. We give them tools to do budget modeling and charge back, bill back to different lines of business. These are things that you know, traditional internal IT on-premise technology working with, you know, the accounting department solved decades ago, yep. which now changes in the new cloud world. Um, does and the that, other does thing that we, include, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but does sure. that include right-sizing? Um, yep. Yeah, okay. So Absolutely. your a customer is using a lot more than they actually need. That'll come into your report and actually help them use the resources better. Yeah, yeah, and we help them. Um, we help them with that, and we also help them consider alternative purchase models like reserved instances and um, optimizing their spend on compute in those kind of ways. Um, and then we always we always look at what's going to give them the confidence to start trying things in cloud. That's where we marry up a uh, 24/7, 365 support model. So if they're 
doing Azure business with us, they get those two things just for doing business with us. And that's really uh, ramped up their confidence level. And then we we add the value added services on top. And, and um, Lighthouse underpins all those things um, in the way that we access those environments and then extend those technologies, support services and automation engines into each of their Azure subscriptions. Good. Uh, so you've mentioned so far that you have benefits in terms of, of uh, policies and governance, in terms of automation and and uh, and support, in terms of OpEx, CapEx, uh, and financial operations for your customers. Any drawbacks? Anything that you wish would be a little different? Um, certainly. So I think one of the the interesting parts of the interaction with the customer is that they're looking for us to proactively warn them when there is an issue or an outage in their environment. Yep. And that gets difficult when it goes beyond the service layer. So the more complex the cloud environment gets, the more application aware or output of that application aware your monitoring systems need to be. So from a uh, you know technology standpoint, we have to augment the capabilities with third party solutions, which are fairly expensive. Mm -hmm. And um, depending on what the customer's looking to do, also require pretty intimate knowledge of their application or, or you know, application stack. So that creates a, a pretty large uplift in the skills required to deliver those kind of services for those, those customers that are doing native cloud development or um, you know, highly dynamic workloads in cloud. So that's one that's one drawback. You've you've got a as a partner, we had to bring those skills to the table to to meet that challenge. It wasn't plug and play. And I don't I don't know if there would be ever a future where that can be plug and play, but that's that's a um uh, a bit of an uplift, I would say, in, in capabilities. And you got to convince the customer that you can actually dig into their application much deeper than they might be willing to uh, let you to provide those insights. So um, right sizing a VM is fairly easy to predict and, and, and analyze. Right sizing a massive application spread around multiple data centers globally using serverless compute everywhere, that's a totally different scenario where you're looking at user stories and, and you're getting into their DevOps you know, processes, their CI CD pipelines, and that's a whole nother level of interaction. So from that standpoint, um, it's it's a it's a big jump to go from that resell support motion that we are are heavily engaged in to the much more intimate into the customer environment. The technology allows us to do both, but um, convincing the customer they need ha that help is where it gets challenging. <laughs> yeah, but at least the customer can, or your next customer can benefit from that knowledge that you've already acquired and, and get to that point much faster than they would if yep. they were trying to do this on their own. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. Um, our, I guess you could say it's sort of like an economy of skill scale. <laughs> we yep. have the ability to um, learn best practices, update knowledge bases, and then as we as we um, you know solve these challenges for one customer in a specific vertical or industry, that might apply to other verticals or other customers in that same vertical or industry. And we bring those best practices to bear. We, we update our baselines and our images and things like that. And then it, it just constantly improves across multiple customers. Um, one of the, what I think the, the challenges is as they get used to our interaction level in the uh, cost reporting and support and right sizing and those kind of things, especially at the infrastructure layer, yeah. they really expect us to already know if there's a problem or an issue with the Azure layer or even their application layers. The Azure layer uh, is, is a tough one because you know, we're constantly juggling uh, outage alerts and stuff across many customers. So it's, yep. it's, sometimes it's hard to say, is this an Azure platform issue, like a service outage, which is super rare, of course, but, or is it a specific to that customer's application and code issue, things like that. So when you start seeing you know, those proverbial warning lights going off across hundreds of customers, it's like, okay, how do we rapidly drill into this and determine that we need to escalate maybe back to Microsoft and suggest the problem at the platform layer rather than an individual customer. Yeah, so. it's all, it's, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to not, when you're seeing all these warning lights, as you mentioned, across a bunch of different customers to not jump to the conclusion that there's an underlying uh, infrastructure. It might just be a coincidence, Yeah. Uh, but you can't make that assumption. You still have to uh, look it up and ensure that it's not a uh, foundation system. 
Yeah, or even some outside Azure dependency service that we found, you know, maybe customers contracted with somebody like an Adobe or something like that for other parts of their application stack and it's impacting services within the Azure cloud because they're all interdependent across, you know, a hybrid deployment with uh, CDNs or, or third party DNS systems or whatever, you know, there's, there's thousands of examples, but that's always the challenge when we have this level of access, the customers get used to it and they're looking for those immediate answers. And sometimes we can't provide it even with the greatest technology. <laughs> so. Well, uh, Patrick, that was, that was actually enlightening. Uh, there, there's a, there's a, portion of that so like reseller uh, uh, service partner uh, that I've not been really uh, close with in the last in the last few years and uh, and I really enjoyed our conversation it's it really puts in perspective the uh, benefits for the reseller or the partner but also for the customers who are using those systems for support for finops for uh, operations and and troubleshooting so I want to thank you very much for spending the time with us to uh, talk about your experience as a reseller or a service partner, as you mentioned. Uh, I'm going to have to change that uh, that uh, that word in my head and now start stop using reseller and stop using uh, service partner. All right, so Patrick, thank you very much for spending the time with us. Uh, this was very educational for me and for our audience, and uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you. Well Thank you. I really appreciate you having me. And it's been uh, great to uh, just talk about our last couple of years of evolution as a reseller to a services partner. And uh, we're still a reseller, but most of the value we bring is in that services sphere of influence with our customers. So it's been awesome. I really appreciate you. Appreciate uh, you asking me to be on the, on the, on the call here. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. See you later.